Welcome, deer hunters, managers, and enthusiasts. This is Deer University, the podcast of the Mississippi State University Deer Lab. My name is Bronson Strickland. And I'm Steve Damaris. Bronson and I are professors of wildlife management and co-directors of the MSU Deer Lab. Together, we've researched deer across the United States for more than 40 years. In our podcasts, we explain the why and how of deer management based on science. Whether it's research we've conducted or explaining research done elsewhere, we'll offer you a college course in the science of deer management. But don't let Steve scare you. This isn't going to be a review of calculus or chemistry. Instead, we take results of research, reduce it to what's important, and explain how you can apply research to management. So join us for this episode of Deer University. Welcome back, everyone. It's uh, been a few weeks, Marcus. You have been in the field having fun. Oh, yeah. You lucky dog. (laughs) And uh, that's kind of going to be the topic for today is we're going to talk a a theme about prescribed fire. Yeah. Yeah. And that is one of your most favorite things in the world to not only study, but to also do. Yeah. To be a practitioner. Yeah, and benefit from. And benefit from, from a a management and hunting perspective. Yep. So let's let's jump in here, Marcus, with um, just some really, really basic stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, We've had a lot of this in classes over the years, and I think people that may read wildlife management articles or see stuff on tv they hear people like us saying you need to burn you need to burn it's really important to burn Mm -hmm. um why don't you give us just a quick checklist of what's the big deal with burning and why do the animals that we hold near and dear to our heart why do they benefit from fire okay yeah that's a great question and a lot of people probably don't think of all the reasons they maybe have a, a checklist of a few reasons why it's good but uh you know there are there are many different reasons and in particular in the southeastern united states and the eastern united states even in the midwest a lot of a lot of our country has ecosystems and wildlife that are adapted to natural processes in those ecosystems and almost all of them have fire as a part of that natural process so our wildlife species and to include deer or fire adapted species so immediately if that's the way nature intended it you would expect things to benefit from a practice like prescribed fire that is mimicking a natural process and that's that's what we see so uh the the fire is doing a lot of different things specifically uh some of the things that benefit wildlife or that benefit us and being able to observe wildlife or produce more wildlife uh, is related to the way that it affects the plant community. So when you burn, you're setting back succession, or at least the understory uh, structure. So a lot of forest, the succession, you'll you'll start seeing plants move out of the understory into the midstory, and you, you burn it you move that structure back to the understory and then many of our wildlife species and obviously deer benefit from that because they need that developed understory structure to produce habitat some of the components of their habitat so deer obviously can't eat a tree that's you know they can't eat the leaves if they're 30 foot off the ground so that's pretty obvious and that's one thing that a lot of people key in on but uh you know another thing that maybe you don't realize is vegetation that's waist high or lower is really good cover Mm -hmm. and a lot of the benefits that you're getting especially for some of the other nesting wildlife species is actually from cover so those are uh the primary benefits that that most people will realize from burning but you know we have some other benefits like for turkeys for instance when you burn through those stands you're you're exposing many foods that may be hard to find like seeds things like that you also could be killing a large portion of the insect population which obviously turkeys gobble up so uh you know we, you have a lot of tangential benefits if you were burning for for improving deer habitat you still would gain some of those other benefits for other wildlife that deer may not benefit from directly 
it, there's even Marcus. I'm I'm digging pretty deep mm-hmm. now in terms of way back when. Um, there are some species, and the one I think of most charismatically would be Bob Whites. Mm-hmm. You would even consider them a, a fire obligate yes. species, wouldn't you? And oh yeah. Simply meaning they are so closely tied to fire that when mm-hmm. fire is removed from the ecosystem. So are bobwhites yeah, for the so, most part. Yeah, basically, uh, bobwhites are a perfect example, and a lot of our other wildlife that are non-game species that are connected to fire are in the same boat. They really are, are specialists in terms of needing fire. Uh, they are closely adapted you know, with, with that process in the system, and they don't deal with situations where it doesn't exist very well, and we see them decline rapidly. Uh, when you exclude fire. Now, things that are more of a generalist, particularly deer, wild turkey, they can still do okay. Uh, They're probably not going to maximize fitness without it, but they still can do okay. And what's your definition of fitness? So that'd be just reproduction of the the population. So how how well can it reproduce and sustain itself? Producing youngins and those yeah. youngins surviving. Yeah, how many youngins Population can you growing. produce? Yeah, and how how well do they do? Uh, okay, so let me ask you this, um, and this is not a setup here, but we say a lot. I think a lot of people understand that they could go out and see a a forest that might be fifteen, twenty, or greater years of age, and mm-hmm. I think they can see with their own eyes, especially if the tree canopy is completely closed and is shaded out the understory, I think they can see that, man, all the food's gone. And to a large degree, all the cover is gone. Mm -hmm. Um, But if someone that didn't have any experience or know why or how to utilize fire to manage the vegetation and manage succession, why can't someone just, like, mow or as we say, bush hog, mm-hmm. or even disc or plow. What are, what would be pros and cons of what fire can do to a landscape versus, say, what bush hogging right. could do to a landscape? Well, a lot of the times, things that you're using a tractor for, so if you're mowing or disking, that's pretty difficult in a lot of forested situations. So one one benefit of fire is, is you can use it in places you may not be able to use the, the other equipment. Uh, but when, you know, if you're managing an old field, fire, a lot of the plants that we desire in that field are fire adapted plants. And uh, when you burn in that system, uh, you stimulate those plants in a, in a variety of ways that you wouldn't with mowing in particular, but even disking in some cases. Uh, fire scarifies seeds which helps some seeds to germinate it exposes mineral soil which is you know preparation of the seed bed for things to germinate better Uh, you know those things you wouldn't necessarily get out of other practices you know the use of herbicides even could be included in that you may be doing real well at managing the competition so the plants that you don't want but you're not necessarily releasing those those plants that need the fire to germinate and do well. So, and you also incorporate, you know, a lot of the things that you burn turn into nutrients, which get incorporated mm-hmm. back into the soil. So, uh, that's a real benefit that you get from fire that you may not get from other things. Now, the disking, you tend when this with the soil disturbance, you tend to favor annual forbs, which are great plants for a lot of these wildlife we're talking about. And some, in some cases, I've seen, you know, if you have a CRP field or some sort of old, old field scenario and you continuously burn it regularly over and over, you start to favor perennial warm season grasses, which is not a bad thing, but it could get to a point where you're overwhelmed with grass mm-hmm. and disking is really useful to uh, to combat that problem mm-hmm. so you don't necessarily need herbicides you know if you get to a situation where you have 95 percent of your plant community is native warm season grass that's probably more than you want and disking can actually revert where 
you know, where that's the problem back to a balance between the annual forbs and the perennial grasses that you actually want, especially for bob whites that'd be important. But even for deer, you know, they're, they're not eating those grasses. They provide excellent cover. Mm-hmm. But, uh, you know, the, the interspersion of, of some of those annual forbs is pretty important from, you know, from a food production standpoint. So if, if I, uh, and, buy a piece of land inherit a piece of land lease a piece of land and there's a nice uh 20 30 15 whatever acre old field Mm -hmm. and what what i you know and that first if you get in this already seven eight ten years into growth then year one there are going to be some different techniques you might have to use it might be some chainsaw might be some Mm -hmm. herbicide and a lot of things but when you get into managing it what i and i i tend to oversimplify but i try to paint a real simple picture for mm-hmm. people is if you bush hog that every year or two you're essentially creating a grazing system for cows mm-hmm. because you're just going to pr- be promoting grasses and perennial grasses and things like yeah. that and and that is exactly not what we want for deer and for most other wildlife is right. we want a mixture mm-hmm. annual plants forbs grasses and fire and disking is important for that mm-hmm. well uh you know the the mowing the mowing and fire actually would promote very similar plants over time in terms of the grasses so those perennial grasses that's sort of what i was talking about if you continuously use fire the difference is fire also promotes a lot of other plants and it gets rid of that duff layer so you have a a great seed bed and some of the forbs that you are desiring need the fire to scarify the seed so that it can germinate so you're getting that out of fire the mowing i mean everybody's mowed their yard or whatever you know you're just clipping the grass off and laying it on the ground Mm -hmm. that is not promoting the seed bed to germinate so that's one reason the fire would be much better than mowing but in the long run you would end up you know i've seen it time and time again you end up with perennial grasses or favoring perennial grasses uh, which is not not a bad thing necessarily but you don't want it to be all yeah, it depends on what you grass. want. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, even yeah, if if you were producing biofuel or you're trying to graze cattle, those having all grass is not a bad thing. Right. But mm-hmm. if you're trying to manage habitat, you don't want it to be all grass. What What about uh, altering it like this? Would the time of fire on that um, old field or that opening mm-hmm. we're talking about? Is when you drop a mash and when you burn going to affect species composition? Yes, that is absolutely it will, uh, particularly with disking. But fire is the same way when you when you burn or disk during the spring or early summer, you tend to favor soft seeded plants, which almost all of those are things you don't want especially non-native plants and if you do it later in the season so late summer into the fall you tend to promote hard seeded plants which are things like ragweed and partridge pea those sorts of things that you really want in Mm -hmm. the plant community they have a really hard seed and once they get scarified they can persist over winter to the next growing season you really favor those plants okay so the time you know if, when you disturb it really early those plants the seeds respond immediately so a soft seeded plant can dominate and take scenario. advantage of the situation right you've if you released it, them if you do it late in the season they have to persist for six months mm-hmm. before they can germinate in the next growing season and the hard seeded plants do that much better than the soft seed you gave plants. them the competitive advantage yes so, so you tend to the the later season uh stuff you know at the end of the growing season tends to favor things that you want which makes perfect sense if you start looking at nature and when nature did those things that's when it was it was late summer how are you defining late summer for our neck of the woods let's say mid-south and deep south yeah basically july on through the end of growing season okay on into september yeah the end of september end of se- maybe into october even okay but as we all know it starts getting pretty wet so yeah. you want to do it before it gets really wet 
so we tend to have most of our rainfall you know in november centered on november so okay let, let's go into probably the more common scenario of someone's riding down the road and they see something being burned more than likely in the south it's going to be a pine stand mm-hmm. and more than likely it's going to be around march yep give or take mm-hmm. uh if you don't mind kind of walk through what is what is the purpose of that kind of fire and that kind of stand mm-hmm. during that time of year yep. and is that good or bad for wildlife okay well uh, to answer that last question it's still good for wildlife may not be maximizing the benefit of fire for wildlife and uh, I'll, I'll go into that in more detail but you tend to see it in in uh, longleaf or live lolly plantation because we think of pines being an extreme fire adapted plant so they have a really thick bark to make sure that they protect themselves from fire. Their leaf shape, those needles, are they're actually modified leaves that help the fire burn. So they promote fire to help control their competing plants. Uh, it helps them germinate their seeds. You know, it gives them all sorts of fitness advantages over other plant species. That fire is h- actually helping them be more competitive. Mm-hmm. So there's We definitely think of those as being an extreme example of fire adapted plants. Typically we would burn early in the growing season because of of the human element. So one thing that's not fun is to burn when it's 100 degrees outside. That's miserable. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So people don't like doing that. So that's Mm -hmm. one reason. our climate also tends to be pretty stable in terms of the conditions you would want to burn during the early uh, or late dormant season you know early growing season so we typically would burn then because it's easier in terms of getting the smoke to disperse and to control the fire Mm -hmm. Uh, you know we have those stable those stable conditions that are easy to burn in so that's another problem uh, reason that we would use that Uh, another reason we historically have used that timing of fire is because the objectives of using fire typically uh, from a lot of a lot of different agencies at least at least historically were to manage fuel so they're trying to burn up fuel so that we don't have a catastrophic wildfire yeah so that's a completely different objective than what you would uh, be burning for wildlife for you may get some wildlife benefits out of it, but you're not necessarily maximizing those. Yeah. Uh, so there, those are a lot of reasons why you would typically see it at that time of the year and in pine. So, so. to recap, in, in a pine forest, mm-hmm. it's it's reducing fuel loads yeah. for a catastrophic fire, yep. protecting the investment of the forest, yep. and then also it's reducing the competition mm-hmm. of your cash crop, sure. your trees. Yeah. And then, yeah, as you say, there are some benefits for wildlife as well. Sure. Okay. Now, if you were going to take that same scenario, and I'm going to have this forest, and my sole objective, not my sole objective, but I'm certainly prioritizing wildlife habitat, Mm -hmm. what would you do different? Uh, Well, I would change when I light the fire. Okay. Timing of the fire. Uh, Yeah. So, uh, let me reiterate, that timing of fire, there's... There are benefits to burning at that time. Okay. So, for instance, turkeys. If you're a turkey hunter and you burn on March 15th, which is the opening day of turkey season for Mississippi, if you burn on that day, you're going to have turkeys in that burn plot during your hunting season that you can uh, try to kill. Yeah. That's a benefit. So Burn at the 15th, start hunting at the 16th. Yeah, so in that case... Your objective is not necessarily to maximize the benefit of the fire to turkeys. Your 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 uh, more proximate objective in that case is to be able to hunt turkeys more efficiently, and you're using fire to do that. Mm-hmm. So, while turkeys love fire and will respond to it, that's not necessarily the best time to burn for a turkey. So, think about what I was talking about earlier. And uh, the video that we have online, I have a 
picture that I attached to the to that video that you can see this happening when, when you burn through a stand you're killing a lot of insects right insects are really high in protein so when do turkeys need that they need that when they're growing feathers or when they're really young and trying to grow really fast so they're growing their entire skeletal structure uh, their body mass and feathers that's when they have an extreme need for insects when you burn later so right after nesting when you have poults running around that have a extreme protein need you have just created a situation that made it very easy for those turkeys to find protein. So we commonly see a hen with poults out in fields, and that's what they're doing. They're bugging. But, Mm -hmm. you know, fire is really important also because it's really easy to catch a cooked bug. (laughs) There's not much to cover them up and hide them. Yeah, they're just sitting on the ground, and they're not moving anymore. Easy pickings. Yeah, so Mm -hmm. uh, that picture, I, I think it was a shield bug that I had the picture of, but... You know, it's just laying there, and it was obvious when I was walking through those stands. They're just bugs laying around everywhere, dead. Of and we'll do that, turkey. Marcus. We'll we'll post that photo yeah. uh, on our Facebook page yeah. Yeah. when we announce this podcast. Sure. Yeah. So make sure you go if you're not uh, not following the Facebook page. We are trying to put up information, especially information relevant to some of the podcasts, and uh, so you can visually see that stuff. So automatically when you start thinking about what the fire is doing and how that might benefit you know your your targeted species you can understand why timing might be important and you may pick you know i'm not recommending that everybody burn everything right after turkey nesting if you were trying to manage turkeys they get some benefit from the earlier fire and you would get some benefit from that because Mm -hmm. you get hunt over it Mm -hmm. so you know, they, they still would have some insects and mast and things like that hanging around later into the summer, but, uh, you know, maximizing it would have, you would have some of it burned during that time. And I don't want to go on too much about turkeys because I know this is supposed to be about deer. Yeah, but, this is Deer University, you know, man. The turkeys are gobbling right now, and, and yes, uh, they are. it's hard for me not to think about those. Mm-hmm. So if we think about deer, we get. So when you burn early like that, you still get some benefits, especially from moving vegetation back into the understory. So that is a definite benefit. You get a, you promote a lot of plants that you want to deer to have access to, especially some of the forbs. Burning at that time of year is still great. If you're trying to maximize production of deer, the resource pulse that would occur after a June fire, for instance, would be overlapping the the really important nutritional time for deer when they're lactating, trying to support fawns. They're, that protein requirement on the female is extreme. Also, if you want to grow bigger antlers, you, you know, during the midsummer, late summer is when they're growing they're, antlers. Yeah, they're growing antlers, and they're really limited. Uh, mm-hmm. with protein in particular so the mineral stump uh, stuff that we've talked about and we've talked about it a little bit with fire that's why that timing could be pretty important it's just like a food plot right you're not planting the same thing in a food plot to maximize hunting success necessarily that you would be planting to maximize nutrition mm-hmm. so it depends on what your objective and what you're using it for and you probably should do a little bit of everything so that you get some benefits from all of the objectives you have so a late summer or early fall burn may be pretty important if you're trying to maximize your hunting success because now all that green luscious vegetation that's responding is occurring during your uh, bow season so you know, you can already see how you might want to mix up the time of year, even if you're managing for deer, mm-hmm. depending on what what you're trying to get out of it. Uh, all right, Marcus. So we've um, talked about this in the past. I don't know if on the podcast or not, but certainly uh, in walking around in the forest and uh, in the truck and so forth. Let Let's talk too about the return on investment from burning being affected by tree canopy coverage Mm -hmm. so if i am in a common i shouldn't say typical common 
uh, scenario where the forest is primarily shading out the understory. Mm-hmm. 80 plus percent coverage. Yep. And I burn. I am in no way, shape, or form going to get the same vegetative response as if there were only 50 or 60 percent sure. canopy coverage. Yep. So the, the response that you're going to get is directly related to how can sunlight mm-hmm. hit, hit the ground and promote the right. growth of plants yeah that's uh especially in my classes that i teach i talk about that until the students are absolutely sick of it wow. because m- many times when you walk into a forest the plants in the understory are light limited mm-hmm. that so let me uh rephrase that so that anybody that doesn't understand if you don't understand what i just said you'll understand this you need food and water if you're food limited I can pour all the water for you that you want, but that's not going to help you unless you have some food too. Right. Because you're food limited. And right. You can flip that. If you're water limited, we can feed you all you want, but you're still water limited. Mm-hmm. It's the same thing in the forest uh, with that understory. If you you can burn it all you want to, but if the plants in the understory are limited by light, they're not going to be able to respond to it. Which is how they make their food. So they're food limited mm-hmm. because of sunlight. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So they, they need photosynthesis to make their, their carbohydrates that they move to the mm-hmm. roots. And if they are limited by light to do that process, it doesn't matter whether you burn or not. You will not get the same or the extent of the response because of light limitations. So all things being equal. So I, this is a it depends. I, I know mm-hmm. it's a it depends that... that <laughs> all situations are not the same but if you were let's say you lease the land mm-hmm. you lease lands and for whatever reason the landowner said sure you can go ahead and light a fire um, but the forest was completely stocked and closed canopy mm-hmm. 95 plus percent would it would it be worth it to burn for some reasons maybe so uh, for instance if you want turkeys in that stand you're going to get them yeah the things that they're using the fire for the resources that you're freeing up for them like acorns or uh you know the the insects that you're killing uh, exposing some of the seeds on the ground those things are still going to come with it you still can increase the food production even of plants for deer uh, the study that I, I worked on this best with, uh, where I can best answer this, was in the in uh, Tennessee. When I was working with with Craig Harper up there, we burned and closed canopy hardwood stands, so upland hardwoods, and in comparison to the control in terms of food production for deer, we doubled it by burning it. So there's no light was still a problem. It was near full canopy closure, but we still doubled the food when we coupled the fire with the canopy reduction. So we had let light to the ground and burned. We increased it by an order of magnitude. So it was a big difference. Times ten. Yeah, tenfold mm-hmm. increase. So that's a huge difference. You still got some benefit from the fire either yeah. way, but it's not even on the same scale. Yeah, as what it would have. You know, if, if light wasn't a limitation, what you would have gotten out of it. And a lot of, you know, we, we see it all the time where we're at. You're, um, the fire could have a short-term kill on some of the, the hardwood mid-story, mm-hmm. but it's not going to be a long-term kill. That's yeah. more than likely you're going to need a herbicide treatment for that. If but, that's what you want to do. Or you could let fire mineral stump it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's... Uh, that's what I would suggest to do. So when you're talking about not a long-term kill, we're top-killing the plant, mm-hmm. and that re-sprouts. And we all know from the mineral stump example that those re-sprouts are, are They're pretty delicious. incredible. <laughs> yeah. so, Nutritious and delicious. But, you know, there's something that I, I wanted to talk about. I knew we would probably get around to the topic eventually, but I think this is a good segue uh, since we, you know, borrow up the... the uh, 
the upland hardwood scenario. So a lot of people, and it, you know, we even talk about being taught this when we were coming through school, you know, years ago, there's a stigma against burning and hardwoods. And uh, I think there's good reason for that. Um, a lot of foresters in particular over the years uh, have taught me that and I've even heard it from wildlife biologists you don't, As burn, have I. Yep. Yeah, you don't burn in your oak stands well I think it's like all things it's it's one of those uh, those stigma that has a little bit of truth to it and a little bit of you know fuzzy you know the misunderstanding so when you're burning in hardwoods the the plants in that system are less fire adapted or at least we think of them less fire adapted than pine Mm -hmm. so it's easier to damage a tree particularly if you're in a bottom one hardwood system so those bottom one hardwoods historically most of the time it's too wet for a fire to naturally occur, occur in that stand so when it is dry enough to burn in a bottom one hardwood system it's probably in conditions where you are likely to damage some of the trees or if not kill them and you you can have a catastrophic fire with those types of conditions yeah so uh you know because of that we typically frown upon burning in hardwoods but you know some of that's misinformation so notice i specified bottom one hardwood Mm -hmm. so those the oaks in that system are less fire adapted than the oaks are in upland systems. So like white oak, that's a that's a fairly fire adapted species. So oaks in the uplands in the the entire central hardwoods and, and southern Appalachian regions are consisting the uplands are consisting mostly of fire adapted oaks. And uh, one thing that I've never hear anybody talk about this, and I I think it's a really interesting scientific tidbit. Oaks, a a lot of their leaf shape, so you know how we can tell the oaks apart based on the shape of their leaves? Oh, yeah, yeah. And some of them have really, especially uplands, they tend to have really similar characteristics, like a lot of lobing. Mm -hmm. Uh, Mm Mm-hmm. They, if you pay attention on the ground when it's dry, they curl up. So those characteristics are actually an adaptation of that oak to promote fire. So it is actually producing a substrate that promotes burning. But behaving like a pine needle. Yes, exactly. Yeah. It's not to the same extent. Mm-hmm. It is not as flammable as the pine needle. The pine needle obviously has a pretty extreme shape, making yeah. it very flammable. It also has some, some uh, compounds in it that are, that are more flammable. Uh, but an upland oak leaf is absolutely flammable. Now, there are other uh, plant species in the system. We Scientifically, we would call them a mesophyte. So it's a plant that's trying to obstruct fire. So in other words, this strategy is to produce leaf litter and water conditions that dampen the effects of fire or or in other words keep fire from moving through the system what what would be some examples of that red maple is a perfect example sweet okay. gum uh many of the hickory species a lot of those are less fire adapted in terms of their leaf shape and the composition of the leaf and even the moisture content and the way that they retain water in the the leaf when it's on the ground you know it's already fallen off the tree the the moisture conditions itself are different so we've got a pretty cool study uh, and you know, the video that we've uploaded on facebook page is, mm-hmm. is from this study where we're looking at uh in the system how fire moves through the system and how hot it is we actually have these little tags that we are putting next to different kinds of trees and we're seeing exactly that the fire intensity around a red maple decreases substantially on the same fire as it would be on a white oak right over the you know 10 yards from it like the the plants are ecosystem engineering what they need so and it's really cool to think about. And it's all that, from the leaves, yeah. primarily. Yeah, a lot of it. And uh, there are other things that are going on, like the mm-hmm. plants actually, they actually direct water down their own stem. 
Miso fights are really good at that in comparison mm-hmm. to oaks, so they want it to be really moist around their own tree's self. Mm-hmm. So there actually there are a lot of characteristics about say red maple that would make fire not burn well, mm-hmm. whereas the opposing characteristics of the upland oak are actually promoting fire and that's a strategy you know they're taking different strategies to try to outcompete each other right right so when fire is in the system the oaks are definitely outcompeting those mesophytes which well, that's really cool. That that's the arms <laughs> race, right? Yeah, evolutionarily. Yeah. So, and one's and promoting fire, it, one's protecting yeah. itself from it. And fire is mediating that that mm-hmm. uh, interaction between the species. And when there's fire in the system, it's promoting oak. And when there's not fire in the system, it's promoting the other ones. We're actually seeing that happen over a large portion of the central hardwoods and southern Appalachians. There's been a shift, and we're calling it. Uh, I think scientists, I haven't actually called it in any of the primary literature myself, but other scientists that have been studying this are calling that mesification. Mm -hmm. So the lack of fire in the system is actually promoting fire intolerant species that Mm -hmm. are, you know, changing the way that water moves through the system. It it has all kinds of effects, uh, which is probably too much to go into for this, but uh, I think understanding that these plants especially oaks are fire adapted and they actually need that to be most competitive is is something that people don't think about and you probably should so well so way back when marcus when we were told that you can't burn in hardwoods we were typically i'm probably oversimplifying here but it was you're going to kill the tree and or 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 at minimum you're going to damage the tree yeah and so it won't be marketable anymore, right. things like that. Um, what can people do? So is there a time of year that's safest? Is there a type of fire that's safest? Mm-hmm. What would be kind of the precautions you could use to... And accidents can happen, of yeah, course, yeah. but... Well, and I'm not going to... You know, you can take all the precautions you want. You still may damage a tree or kill mm-hmm. one. I mean, it's, you know, the same thing is going to happen if you're burning longleaf. You can kill longleaf with fire. Yeah. I've done it. I know how to do that. So that's not the target most of the time, obviously. But it's a little bit easier to kill an oak with fire, even a fire-adapted oak, than it is a longleaf pine. So that's when we think of pine being more fire-adapted. But mm-hmm. uh, Yeah, so there, there are some precautions, and that's uh, one of the things that we really highlight in the, the video I was trying to show some of the common precautions that are really easy for you to take. One is the firing technique. So you don't want to use firing techniques that make really hot fires. So in particular, a ring fire gets way too hot, and you're going to damage or kill oak trees if you use that firing technique. And it just gets, especially in the center of the stand, when the fires converge. So when I'm talking about a ring fire, I'm talking about you just make a ring all the way around your burn unit. You completely close it in with fire. And it's it burns re- inward. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Every, the fire is moving toward itself in all directions. So it would be a ring fire. That's bad for a lot of different reasons. Uh, one, it's hard for wildlife if they're in the middle of that to escape. So some, unless they can dig a hole or they can get up a tree or fly away, they have a hard time getting out of that without mm-hmm. uh, potentially getting injured or, or killed. So, you know, it's typically frowned upon, that technique. And uh, another reason, if, if you have any interest in not killing trees, that's a bad technique because it gets very hot in the middle of it. Yeah. So typically avoid that technique altogether. And I would recommend that in any type of forest, but uh, particularly oak stands. But, you know, backing fires can be a, a really good tool. It takes a long time to burn, but we're talking about, uh, you know, most of the time when you're lighting a fire, you would start with a backing fire anyway. And that is basically lighting a low intensity fire that moves against the against wind. Against the wind. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So you're lighting it on the downwind side of the stand and it backs into the fire and that's, or into the wind. That's why it's called a backing fire. Uh, the stands that we recently burned, the upland hardwood stands, we were uh, using a flanking fire technique, which is where you actually you establish a nice buffer with that backing fire and then you start pulling the fire up the sides into the wind. Mm-hmm. So you can imagine that fire is peeling off of the fire break and sort of 
you know, going with the wind a little bit, but not to the same extent. You don't give it enough head of steam to right, just sweep right. over the whole stand. So that speeds up the process a little bit, but you get a little mm-hmm. higher flame height. Uh, we also use spot or strip head fires, but you typically you would you would create your buffer with your backing fire, and then you let's say a strip head fire you would imagine going up in the stand 10 or 15 yards and then lighting a new line of fire that burns as a head fire into your black line Mm -hmm. so that that's called strip heading Mm -hmm. fire and again you're not letting it get enough steam to where it can get really hot so that's why we'd be stripping it rather than just you know starting a head fire on the very end of the stand so you're letting it burn a head fire uh, in small chunks, right. so they can't get a head of steam. And, and uh, with head fire, just to be specific about what I'm talking about, I'm talking about a fire that is moving with the wind. So on the upwind side. So can can you generalize for people? W- would you ever in hardwoods? Would you ever want a complete head fire? I mean, I guess you're going to have to look at fuel and all sorts of conditions. Yeah, I mean. It, the main reason that I would use it is because it speeds up the process a little bit, but I typically, especially in hardwoods, I don't use I don't use very aggressive head fire techniques. So I'm using strip head fire, and relative to what I would do in pines, the the strip head is a much narrower width than it would have been in the a pine stand. Okay. So, and that's because I don't normally want to kill any overstory trees. I'm trying to protect those. So, and I've I've done this successfully in a lot of places uh, over long periods of time where we had lot, many fires entering the stand without damaging the overstory. So, there's a couple other things that you can do that are pretty important. Uh, another one is if you have if you have debris in the stand so you have a fallen limb or maybe you had a a a dead tree that fell down next to one of your oaks that you don't want to damage you need to take a little bit of time and move those away from the tree so if you have particularly you know you have a few stems like maybe you have a really good white oak you don't want to damage that tree it's really important to make sure it doesn't have any slash around it that can catch on fire then basically what's happening is you know, if that log or, or whatever catches on fire next to the stem, it holds fire next to it for an extended period of time, and that that heat is allowed enough time to heat up the cambium so that it's damaging to the tree. So we'll get we'll see cat facing, uh, which is just a, a wound on the tree, and that decreases timber value. It may not kill the tree, and it I, I honestly could produce some wildlife habitat benefits from having that cat facing but typically people don't want to decrease the value of their trees right so just take some time to do that i've done it on 10 15 20 acre blocks you know just take a a half hour and go in and make sure you remove those things and uh this has been very effective another thing that i see really commonly if you have a dead tree that's already standing in there go in and rake around it so that tree that dead tree is prone to catch on fire and it will sit there and smolder if it's close to your line it's one of the more common reasons that a fire will get out so you don't want that to happen obviously but also you know if that snag is standing there and it's smoldering and then it falls down next to one of your trees Mm -hmm. you don't want to damage it could be a reason that one gets damaged and you know ultimately I've, i've worked with people before and and uh you know they have that one tree man they've got that bow stand on it and it's a white oak it's producing right in the middle of bow season every single year and it's just a deer magnet and i don't want that tree to get killed if you have some of those trees go rake around them just rake the leaf litter out from around it you know maybe a couple of yard buffer and you don't have to worry about it mm-hmm it, so just take that precaution. You know, it takes extra time and effort, but if you're if it's that important to you, then just do that. And, and it's that word again that we use a lot. You know, a lot of people would call it brush or debris, but for a fire, it's fuel. Yeah. If you have removed all the fuel from around that tree, you have essentially protected it. Protected yeah. it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you know, I do that occasionally. But uh, typically, if you move the the large woody debris, so the limbs or or fallen trees and that sort of thing, are away from the base, you don't have problems with damaging trees. Especially if you use really low intensity firing techniques. 
Now I'll tell you, if you're bringing a, a five or 10 acre block and you use only a backing fire, that's gonna take a while. Mm-hmm. It may take you all day to burn that one block. Just five to 10 acres? Yeah. Unless it's a really long, narrow block, it, it takes a long time for a fire to back across a stand. Yeah. That's why we would use those other techniques in combination. Yeah. Still being careful not to, to create a, a hot fire. So if you can keep the flame height under two or three foot, you're not going to have problems with burning up trees as long as you take those other precautions. Okay. Well, Marcus, we've been yakking a while here. Um, Why don't we wrap up with, why don't you tell everybody what they can be looking forward to with these burning projects that uh, you Mm -hmm. and colleagues and students have began? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, I'm really excited about several of these because obviously I'm a, a pyromaniac and, and an enthusiast about this stuff. But so uh, one thing that I want to throw in that, that I think that the uh, listeners would be interested in, we burned our upland hardwood sites for this these experiments you're talking about on the opening day of turkey season. And uh, I even said it in the video, and I was partially kidding in the video, but lo and behold i came back to the stand that we did that video in so if you go and look on facebook the video where i talk about the turkeys being in that stand the next morning i went back to that stand we we stopped lighting it or the fire was completely out at five o'clock in the afternoon i came back at seven o'clock that afternoon to check it just to make sure we didn't have any you know smoldering logs or anything to worry about with the fire jumping and i pushed a long beard out of the stand he was roosting in the stand two hours after we put it out i could not believe that a long beard roosting in the smoke smoke is still in the air yeah and he's roosted when there. He, I, I pushed him out of the stand before i knew he was there but i was looking at the tree he was in and it was literally engulfed in smoke <laughs> and i was like you know he just wanted to smell the smoke yeah like, maybe so i don't know how he knew to do that but i could not mm-hmm. believe immediately the turkey responded to that and we had cameras running in that stand for months so we were keeping up with how much turkey use there was and we had not had a turkey picture in that stand for over a month Mm-hmm. So I, I I just couldn't believe that, you know, he saw the smoke and he's like, I'm going over there. That's where yeah. I'm going to be hanging out. That's going to be and easy the, hunting the next yeah, day. And I took a picture of what I was talking about with the food that was made available for right, him in there. Right. I, you know, I think they just innately know they're fire adapted species. They know that fire is good and I need to go over there. Mm-hmm. And uh, that picture, I think, is a perfect illustration because there's three or four different kinds of food in, the, in it, and uh, I just thought it was amazing. And that's, you know, those are the kind of the things that make me really excited because I'm right. an avid turkey hunter, and you know, seeing something work literally perfectly like that is just amazing to me. And we had a similar thing in our, our pine forest from last May that uh, part of this experiment where we had cameras running before and after, and. Uh, we burned in may and then the next morning we had turkeys pitched down in front of cameras in the burn stand so they're literally responding immediately deer are going to be delayed a little bit uh, because they're wait they're not getting the same kind of resources they're obviously eating the plants so mm-hmm. typically see that them really attracted to it two to three weeks at least after uh but yeah, I just thought it was amazing. So I wanted to share. Oh, that it with is everybody. amazing. It is but, amazing. Uh, yeah, to, to directly answer your question, uh, uh, starting experiments in four different systems to look at the timing of fire and see how that affects habitat for different wildlife species. So, uh, particularly deer and turkey and quail. But uh, we'll be doing a fire season experiment in longleaf, loblolly prairie and upland hardwood so what I'm, so what's your timing what are your d- different times yeah you're so testing? uh we we wanted to do it uh to be relevant to what we do on the landscape already and then compare that to what nature would have done mm-hmm. so we have a mid-march fire which is our prescribed fire and if you look at when we light prescribed fire and this you can look at it from the scale of the nation or just the southeast or just the state whatever scale you want to look at it's the same same everywhere uh that peaks in march so 
the majority of fires are definitely uh, right in the middle of March. So prescribed fire season peaks right then. Mm-hmm. And uh, lightning season, if you look at it, any of those scales is very different than that. It, it's actually midsummer. So typically from late June through late July would be when fires are actually caused by lightning. So we want to see, uh, from a wildlife habitat standpoint, what are the differences in that. And uh, with the the oak study in particular, I wanted to look at it a little bit differently with that. So we have that experiment going, but one thing that we also did in combination is we split the plots. So we have a burn treatment. We made half of it where deer cannot access it and half of it they're allowed access and that will actually allow us to measure how much are deer affecting the outcome of the burn and how much are they benefiting from it as well exactly yeah yeah. (laughs) so you could actually see are the plant community responses that you're seeing are they being affected by what deer are doing in it and then based on what deer did in it what did deer get out of it right 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 yeah Mm-hmm. So, uh, really cool. I'm very excited, and th- you know, there aren't any other studies like this that have been done, uh, especially across that many systems. So, I'm very excited about it, and and that's what a lot of the graduate students in the Deer Lab will be doing over the next several years. I think over the next few years too, as we talk more and more about this, we're going to be convincing a lot of people they need to burn. Oh yeah burning is good yeah now it's difficult it's one of the more advanced uh techniques to use because it takes some preparation and expertise but there are resources available to help people do that so a a quick technical question on that marcus is um when you when you're planning for a fire Mm -hmm. let's just say june or july is it a lot more difficult to get a permit to burn that time of year Mm mm-hmm yeah, it is because the the range of conditions that you can burn in safely are more narrow, and the weather is not as stable. Yeah, you know we were talking about that earlier. While we burn early season, those things make it harder to get permits too. So it sure as heck isn't as fun to burn when it's ninety degrees. Yeah, it's going to be harder opportunity wise for you to be able to do it. Yeah, but what you hope, what you are pretty sure you know now, and what you hope to prove is that the benefit is going to be well worth the effort, though, yeah. in terms of wildlife habitat. We, yeah, we, we absolutely already know that there are a lot of benefits that aren't realized by other timings of mm-hmm. fire, but it's harder to do. I think, we, you know, at a minimum, people need to know what they're losing by not doing that. Right. What are they giving up? Yeah. yeah. So if you know that, uh, at least you have the information necessary to make a good choice. Mm-hmm. So, and if it's still not worth it to you, then that's great. That's right. If you're using fire, great. If you don't want to use it, then, you know, that's fine. But if you're a deer junkie and you want to get, you want to take 98% good to 100% good, it's going to be worth it. Yeah, if you want to maximize deer habitat and deer nutrition and your hunting experience, then then fire is often a part of that. So, Marcus, here's a real common question we get in deer management all the time. How big of a property do you need to manage for deer, manage for quality deer, mm-hmm. manage for trophy deer? Um, let's bring this back to prescribed fire. How big of an area are you going to need to burn to really have some measurable impact to make it worthwhile? Yeah, that, that's a great question and, and uh, something that I think we definitely should cover because instinctively, at least I do it and I, I hear it from people all the time when I'm talking to them, that we instinctively are thinking about that 30 acre stand or that 50 acre stand or, you know, a large, relatively large acreage for most people to accomplish. Uh, it may seem daunting, but uh, just so I can bring it back to turkeys for a minute. Uh, Go ahead. <laughs> that turkey that was roosting in the burn block Mm -hmm. that was a one acre fire one acre one acre one burned acre compelled him to move yeah he was he decided i need to roost in that burn block that one acre that got burned that is impressive so 
you know, when you're thinking about scale, you know, especially if you're trying to mix up the seasons and you're not comfortable burning in hardwood, your hardwoods during the summer, what, you know, whatever, maybe you're, you're just starting and you're not really comfortable burning a large acreage, it doesn't have to be that large. So, you know, a one acre, five acre burn, you know, something like that, something that you feel comfortable with, especially if you're in one of those boats where you need to feel safe. And yeah. something you can manage with fewer number of people. Yeah, you don't need, you know, mm-hmm. a one-acre burn, a couple of people can pull that off pretty yeah. easily. So uh, it also could, si- it could make the permit easier. Uh, so I was going to ask you, permitting-wise. Yeah. yeah, so uh, those kinds of things uh, could be easier on a much smaller-scale burn. And, you know, so if you're in that boat, even if you can only burn an acre or two, I mean, you only plant an acre food plot mm-hmm. or a two-acre food plot, you're not planning the whole world you know so uh, some of that is because it costs money and it's more difficult to do larger scale you maybe you want to plant a 15 acre soybean field but you just don't have that much area or you don't have that much money or whatever it's the same thing with burning you can get benefits out of pretty small burns and you know uh, one thing i wanted to add to that uh, i know you know about it but the audience don't we we have a little treat for people coming up on uh, how small that scale can be and how that could benefit your deer hunting so uh, we're working on that I'm glad you now. said that i was about to i yeah. was about to ask you but i didn't know if you wanted me to let the cat out of the bag well so i don't want to you... let the results out just yet but okay. i think you'd be remarkably uh intrigued by how small of a scale you can burn out to be very affected for or effective for your hunting experience so this might be something marcus if a one acre burn can cause a an old gobbler to roost some smaller burning similar size burning mm-hmm. or, you know you might change a deer's mind too oh yeah yeah okay. just like a one acre food plot changes a deer's mind often mm-hmm so, uh, yeah, think about it like that. If, if you need to burn at a small scale to feel safe or be able to accomplish it, that's okay. Um, you know, a really big lesson here, too, is that often we think we can't do anything on our property. You know, uh, mm-hmm. we feel overwhelmed or I can't treat, you know, I can't go out and treat 50 acres or plant 20 acres of food plots. There's always a little nip and a tuck mm-hmm. like what you're describing. You can always do something. Yeah, you can get a little something out of it. tilt the odds in your favor. Yeah, you can go cut down a few trees. Mm-hmm. You can, you know, maybe till up an a old road bed or something. You know, yeah. the smaller scale can still be effective. Management works. Mm-hmm. Well, Marcus, I have kept you long enough okay i know i know that you know Mm -hmm. um that birds are gobbling outside right now so i'm gonna let you get back at it but thank you very much for spending some time with us and talking about about burning and, and what you've got going on yeah love it we'll do it again soon all right appreciate it we're glad you joined us today and hope you learned something valuable about deer management if you have questions about this podcast or a question about a topic we haven't discussed, please log on to msudeerlab.com, click on the Deer University tab, and send us your questions. We'll get to them as soon as possible. In closing, we want to thank our employers, the Mississippi State University Extension Service and the Forest and Wildlife Research Center. We also want to thank the St. John and Dudley Hutchinson families for their endowments that support deer research and education.